And without further ado, I'd like to introduce the NCMA's Curator of Ancient Art and the Director of Research, uh, Caroline Rochelot, who will introduce her lecture for today. Welcome, Caroline. Well, thank you, Maria, for this uh, lovely introduction and uh, the great work that you have been doing on this um, lecture series for Golden Mummies of Egypt. Um, as Maria mentioned, today's program is a teaser for the Golden Mummies exhibition, which opens on March 6th. And what I like about this exhibition is that it's more than just about mummies. It's about people, their religious beliefs, their hope for the afterlife at a time when Egypt is ruled by the Macedonian Greeks and later the Romans. It's a period of cultural diversity that offered different choices for self-representation in funerary arts. Um, the exhibition also uh, puts these te themes into their religious, social, uh, political, and cultural context, but also sheds light on the colonial context of the archaeological discovery of the mummies and associated objects. Golden Mummies of Egypt is developed and produced by Nomad Exhibitions and fe features parts of the superb Egyptian collection at Manchester Museum. And I am delighted to have Manchester Museum's Egyptologist join us to deliver the first lecture in the series, my friend and colleague, Campbell Price. Dr. Price obtained his PhD in 2010 in Egyptology from the University of Liverpool, UK, where he is now an honorary research fellow. After conducting fieldwork at Zawiyat Um El Rakam, Saqqara and the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, he became in 2011 the curator of Egypt and Sudan at Manchester, which is part of the university. Gamble Price is the author of Golden Mummies of Egypt, available at the NCMA store, um, the spectacular publication that accompanies the exhibition. He has published widely on ancient Egyptian material culture and maintains special interests, uh, research interests, sorry, in sculpture and the construction of ancient Egypt in museums. He has lectured extensively throughout the UK and internationally, and now I can also say virtually, having attended many of his uh, online lectures in the past year. Today, he is here with us virtually to discuss sex, art, and death in Greco-Roman Egypt. Campbell, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, uh, Maria, and thank you to North Carolina Museum of Art. I'm so delighted, excited uh, to see the exhibition opening at its second venue um, and very proud of uh, the work that's gone into it. And I should say, by way of introduction, that it was down to Caroline, in fact, uh, that the exhibition happened at all. Uh, we had a discussion at a meeting in Chicago a few years ago and she was looking for an exhibition and we in Manchester Museum were working on our Golden Mummies exhibition and it was a perfect uh, fit. Now almost exactly one year ago uh, Caroline and I were sharing a cocktail in a bar in downtown Buffalo uh, in New York State. Um, little did we know at that time how the world would change in 365 days. And I am really sorry not to be able to be physically in, in North Carolina, but this is, uh, I guess, a good alternative. So um, a special uh, hello to everyone joining from North Carolina. Uh, I know this is an international Zoom audience and I recognize several names uh, in the audience, but uh, yeah, a special hello to you if you plan and hopefully at the end of the lecture will intend to visit, if you can, safely uh, the exhibition Golden Mummies of Egypt. So uh, for the next uh, hour or so, I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction into my perspective on, on the thinking of the ancient Egyptians at this time. As Caroline al already suggested, um, this is not simply an exhibition about mummies. The book that accompanies it is not simply about mummies, but about our perceptions uh, of ancient Egyptian material culture. Now, I will give another lecture later in the series in April, uh, specifically about how Manchester Museum acquired this particularly strong uh, group of Greco-Roman 
objects. Uh, but suffice it to say, we have one of the uh, the best collections, uh, suites of these objects, uh, anywhere outside Cairo. So it's a special opportunity, not just to present this material, but to critique it and to try and think, how did we get it and what might it have meant to the people who made, used, interacted uh, with these objects on whatever level. And so I thought for a title, I'd go with something catchy. Uh, so sex, art and death uh, tends to um, tends to, to attract the crowds. Uh, so so uh, this is my, my chosen title. And what I want to do is uh, suggest how uh, some of these objects could be used uh, in the service of the rebirth of the deceased, in the uh, creation of a new divine identity and uh, a way uh, to enable an elite person, and please be quite clear, we're talking about elite people here. When you go into the exhibition, uh, you're not seeing a cross section of society, not at all. You are seeing um, the top of society, perhaps, I don't know, at most five or 10% of the people who could afford these things. Uh, funerary material covered in gold leaf, uh, very fine uh, painted work, uh, as well as the process of mummification itself, uh, which is labour intensive and very expensive. So don't imagine everyone uh, living in Egypt between 300 BC and 100 AD is uh, enjoying this, this kind of treatment after death. They're absolutely not doing, um, but this gives us an insight into elite society which is fundamentally materialistic. They want to perpetuate uh, the, the state of uh, wealth that they had enjoyed in life into the afterlife. And I think this is something where we come back again to our own perceptions. This is why ancient Egypt is so attractive in museums, through books and documentaries, um, because we see something of ourselves in the ancient Egyptians. We uh, recognize a, a materialism uh, a religious materialism, which we find very attractive. So this is the background to the exhibition. Um, you can read more about it in the book. I'll give another plug. As Caroline said, uh, the exhibition physically opens on March the 6th uh, and will be open uh, through to July. And it, the exhibition will travel again uh, after it leaves uh, Raleigh and will return to Manchester at the end of next year. So. When we think about Egyptian art, and Egyptian art is fundamentally the thing I'm most interested in uh, as an Egyptologist, we tend to think of a very stiff, but rather colorful, and in some ways rather dynamic, uh, representation of the world. Now, the problem begins there because Egyptian art is not a simple representation of the world. Because we look at things from the point of view naturally of the 21st century, uh, most of us in the West, the global West, uh, we tend to make assumptions about representations of things and particularly representations of people. So to take a, a classic example, this uh, wall painting from a Theban tomb chapel, 18th dynasty, so the golden age of ancient Egypt, you might say, the, the kind of high noon uh, of ancient Egyptian artistic production, now in the British Museum, um, taken out of its original context and brought uh, to Europe. But here you see the elite ideal. Um, this is not a photograph, it is not a snapshot of family life along uh, the banks of the Nile. Those details uh, that do reference things as they actually were are incidental. This is, uh, without going into a whole lecture about the nature of Egyptian art, this is a highly stylized image. Uh, it is filtered through several different layers of decorum. That is, what is it appropriate to represent? And fundamentally, it is a functional image that is to um, enhance and maintain uh, the image of the deceased uh, for eternity. And it's hoped that this image will last uh, for eternity. It's not doing too badly. Uh, it's almost three and a half thousand years old. And the color of it, very vivid, uh, the portrayal, this idealized portrayal of uh, elite life in this kind of bucolic idyll is something we find very attractive. And I don't want to go on too much about that. Suffice to say, I want to contrast this high New Kingdom 18th dynasty depiction with uh, Ptolemaic art, the art that we encounter 
uh, in the age of the golden mummies. Images here have generally found less favor in Egyptology, and by that I mean uh, the study of ancient Egypt. Egyptologists have been less confident and less comfortable with this material because it kind of falls between uh, three different uh, stools. There is Egypt, there is the influence of Greece and the presence of Greeks in Egypt, and then there is the coming of Rome. And because this is felt not to be pure ancient Egyptian art, it has got rather a bad reputation in the writing of the history of Egyptology. Now, some would say everything from the reign of Ramesses the Great around the 1200s BC uh, represents decline. So when you get to 150 BCE, you're really in the, the nadir of um, <laughs> artistic production. But I rather wonder, and I suggest in the, the book as well, the Golden Mummies book, that I think Greco-Roman funerary art has played out much better to a public audience that doesn't have the biases and the prejudices uh, that scholars carry. Uh, there is something about pharaonic art up to this point that is rather staid and rather stiff, albeit very still very attractive, that changes in the Ptolemaic period. So ruled by a Macedonian Greek royal family that ends in, in uh, the, the death of Cleopatra the seventh, a famous Cleopatra, and then Egypt becomes a province of Rome. There is a, a richness, a fullness, a pliability of the flesh, uh, as suggested in this relief uh, of the king, uh, king, one of the Ptolemies, uh, offering to two deities. Uh, the female figure in particular is, is uh, much more curvaceous. There is something more fleshy about art in the Ptolemaic period, and that continues into the Roman period. And I want just to uh, presage the things I'm about to say about funerary art with this observation about temple art and two-dimensional art in Egypt. When we think of mummies, uh, when we think of funerary art, we ultimately think of mummies, and when we think of mummies in Egypt, we often think of uh, gold. But in many ways, although uh, you will often hear that, that modern technology and CT scans are giving us, you know, unheard of insights into the lives of ancient uh, Egyptians. I'm not entirely sure that's accurate. I rather suspect it's a lot of wishful thinking. Personally, I don't believe there's a lot you can tell from a, a CT scan, not really about the, the, the person. What we are encountering and what uh, we really discuss in the exhibition is the ideal, the elite ideal. And what we are encountering really is a mask. Uh, that mask was not meant to look like uh, the, the, the deceased in question. It is a tool, it is a device to associate um, and to launch the deceased um, from, from the world of the living into the world of the gods, uh, the world uh, the dead wish to inhabit. So when we encounter particularly the Roman period, so around the first uh, century AD, we encounter a kind of split in the road in representing the, the deceased, a bifurcation. So on one hand, there is the traditional representation of the deceased as a masked, often, if you can afford it, gilded uh, face. So we have this on the left. But then there is an innovation that does seem to come uh, from uh, Rome itself, and that is the painted portrait on thin panels of wood uh, using encaustic uh, technique, that is the mixture of uh, pigment with wax on very thin uh, wooden panels, there are representations of uh, the deceased. And these are characterized in modern English as portraits and masks. And here we encounter our first major interpretational problem. Now, this has been pointed out already by one of my predecessors at the Manchester Museum as Curator of Egyptology, um, Dr. Christina Riggs, uh, who's now at the University of uh, Durham. Uh, so over 20 years ago, she pointed out that this uh, use of terminology rather suggests in English that a mask is something you use to hide your actual identity and to uh, kind of masquerade as something else. And a portrait, on the other hand, is something which reveals some inner state, some underlying feature of the person represented. 
this is simply not easily mapped onto what actually I think the ancient Egyptians or the people living in Egypt in the last centuries uh, BCE and the first centuries AD, the first centuries CE are really thinking. Both can be contemporary. So you can have uh, a, a mask, a painted or a gilded mask at the same time as you can have uh, a painted portrait, so-called Fayum portraits I'll come back to uh, later in this lecture. The piece you see on the right, both of these pieces are in uh, the exhibition and most of my illustrative material uh, today is from uh, the exhibition. I tend to mark it if it's not. It's in another collection other than Manchester. This piece on the um, right is quite significant because the archaeologist who found this material at Hawara uh, noted that the essential form of this mummy cover was that that would be expected for a masked mummy. But in fact, rather than the uh, plaster and gilded or painted mask, uh, there is inserted a painted portrait on wood. So these two uh, styles can be contemporary. What was the deciding factor in uh, a family's choice to um, prepare their loved one is not absolutely clear. But suffice it to say, and this is a bit of a spoiler, it doesn't seem to have fallen down what you might call ethnic or, dare I say, racial lines. One doesn't represent simply an Egyptian choice. One does not simply represent a Greek or a Roman choice. But I want to just sketch out a little bit of history of the reception of these images, particularly the gilded and the portrait mummies. The first definitive Western account we have is uh, from an Italian traveller, Pietro della Valle, who um, is born in the, the, the late 16th century and in the early 17th century travels uh, to Egypt. He's a very intriguing chap. Uh, I'd recommend the uh, translations of his uh, travels published in the uh, early 17th century. Pietro, in his travels, he's in... Um, uh, in Persia and he's traveling with his wife and his wife dies and he has her mummified, he has her embalmed and takes her along with him on his travel. So already Pietro della Valle has a rather strange attitude uh, to representations um, and um, actual specimens of mummified uh, people because he's uh, carting around his mummified uh, wife. But this suggests another theme in this lecture, which is the kind of sexualized representation of the deceased, which in some ways uh, to, a, to a kind of straightened Western audience might seem rather strange, but really does seem to be a theme in some of the material we're looking at. Della Valle um, gives the first, as I say, Western account of what we would recognize as a uh, mummies from the Greco-Roman period, including these uh, very striking portrait mummies. He seems to find them at the site of Saqqara, so just outside uh, modern Cairo. And it's interesting uh, that this site otherwise isn't well known for Greco-Roman uh, material, although recent finds uh, have recently made the news. Um, portrait mummies, such as De La Valle describes, uh, have subsequently uh, not been well attested from the site of Saqqara. Saqqara is a site very uh, close to my heart because as a student I did uh, my uh, field work um, there, uh, but it's worth saying that it was a major cemetery throughout the pharaonic period and later, close to the main urban uh, administrative uh, centre of, of Egypt, uh, the capital, if you like, uh, the city of Memphis. So it was a very well used cemetery, so it's perhaps no uh, surprise that De La Valle or the people uh, De La Valle encountered were making uh, finds of this nature there. He describes uh, in, in, in um, a very uh, colorful uh, passage from his, his travelogue, um, encountering these um, mummies and describing them uh, being like being like uh, being like cheese. The mummies are all uh, stuffed in uh, uh, filling a, an underground uh, space, and he describes them as all painted and golden and beautifully stitched. And we know that Della Valle's mummies ended up in 
uh, a museum in Dresden where they can still be seen and they are classic examples of the type. Uh, these early Roman period, uh, first into the early second century AD uh, representations of uh, the deceased. But this is the first moment uh, really in the West that we have an account of these kind of things. The study of Greco-Roman material, uh, the material ultimately that ends up in Manchester and which is in the Golden Mummies of Egypt exhibition, is uh, really brought to the fore by this man uh, and the Egyptian workers who are working for him, uh, William Matthew Flinders Petrie. One of the best known names in Egyptian archaeology, I will actually address Petrie and his legacy at that other lecture I'm giving in April, but suffice it to say, uh, he starts working at the site of Hawara in 1888, uh, the first of three seasons which produce a great wealth of finds. And it's from this source that Manchester uh, receives most of its material. On the map here, if you're familiar with, with Egypt, um, this is the city of Cairo. And uh, just uh, to the um, southwest is this depression of Fayum, uh, highlighted in this little detail box. The site of Hawara is towards the south at the mouth of this area uh, at the Fayum. An important site uh, throughout different periods of Egyptian history but one which is intensively used um, as a cemetery in the Greco-Roman period and that may be because its major feature is this, although it looks rather like a a hill now, it is not a natural hill, it is man-made. This great big pile of mud brick is in fact the core of a 12th dynasty pyramid, the Pyramid of King Amenemhat III. Um, so almost 4,000 years old and it was this uh, that attracted Petrie. He had read classical accounts of uh, a famous labyrinth um, and it was Petrie who really confirmed uh, or, or helped other efforts which confirmed um, that the, the site of the labyrinth was in fact at Hawara and was connected with the pyramid of King Amenemhat III. The labyrinth in reality was a, a massive temple and it's worth saying at this point that uh, the pyramid itself uh, and its association with the king, King Amenemhat III, who was deified after his death and was worshipped as a god well into the Roman period, acted as a beacon for later people. Um, centuries, millennia after the death of that king, people wanted to be buried in the vicinity, in the proximity, not just of a great dead king, but of a god. And this is classic uh, uh, pharaonic tradition, uh, that you can enhance your chances uh, to launch yourself into uh, immortality, into the world of the gods in the afterlife, by being buried uh, near a numinous monument, a monument connected uh, to a divine king uh, from the past. So you get it at the site of Abydos in the south of Egypt, you get it at Saqqara in Giza, and it certainly happens here at Hawara. So this perhaps give us, gives us um, an explanation, if you like, why people, even people who didn't live very close to the Fayum, uh, were asking to be transported after death uh, to be buried near uh, the, the labyrinth or uh, the, the temple and pyramid of King Amenhotep III. Here on Petrie's plan, uh, in one of his excavation reports, you can see his suggested reconstruction of the labyrinth uh, with its associated pyramid, um, but uh, to the north and to the west, although Petrie came to the site of Hawara expecting to, to excavate lots of 12th dynasty Middle Kingdom stuff, classical pharaonic stuff, he in fact found something quite different. He found this incredible stretching necropolis uh, of the Greco-Roman period, and that's really what the site is most famous for. And we have lots of accounts of this. Uh, Petrie published uh, lots of accounts, and there are uh, lots of handwritten uh, letters that he gave uh, by way of updates to his sponsors, because of course, remember, this was a, a financial transaction, although Petrie claimed it wasn't, where he would take donations and he would go out and dig. At the time, um, from the 1880s uh, into the 1910s, it was possible and legal uh, that the Egyptian government allowed material excavated by archaeologists to leave the country, 
as part of a fines division. Uh, this is not uh, true from the 1970s onwards. Uh, all uh, antiquities in Egypt are property of the state. But in the time of Petrie, uh, he was uh, actively allowed and did indeed take a lot of material out of the country. And I'll return to that theme at my uh, lecture in April. But here is uh, one example uh, from uh, the, the archives of the Egypt Exploration Society, uh, a charity I'm very uh, proud to be associated with, um, based in the UK. Uh, the EES uh, holds lots of material related uh, to the work of Petrie. And in this letter, he's writing to a major uh, sponsor, fundraiser, and kind of all round enthusiast, Amelia B. Edwards, the founder of the Egypt Exploration Society. And he describes his work at Hawara. And he says, uh, in relation to this little sketch, this is his camp uh, not far away from the pyramid of Amenemhat uh, III, that here uh, he had been uh, building up a sort of dead house for my mummy friends. This emphasizes a point that he really wasn't expecting the sheer volume of material he encountered. And if you read other accounts uh, of, of uh, Petrie's uh, digs at Tawara, um, various of these are, are reproduced in, in the Golden Mummies book, he gives accounts of finding literally thousands of mummies. And he talks about heaving over um, dozens of mummies every day. He's not recording those mummies, he's making no attempt to um, give any account of their context. And he says himself quite early on in this procedure, uh, that maybe only one or two percent of the whole total of this material uh, of, of mummified bodies are decorated. So like a magpie, uh, uh, I guess he would say by necessity, Petrie is really only focusing on material that is decorated, that can be brought away and uh, given to sponsors or taken to the Cairo Museum. Uh, the best pieces notionally are to stay in Cairo, pieces which are thought to be surplus to requirements are uh, are uh, given to sponsors and leave uh, Egypt, that is that is permitted. But there is very clearly some value judgment going on here. Most of the material, as I say, isn't recorded and for the most part seems to just be left on the site. Uh, we don't have contradictory evidence uh, for that. It's only material that's decorated that Petrie is uh, removing. So to take one example, very striking mummy of a young girl, uh, maybe only three or four years old uh, when she died, but very richly uh, decorated, um, very strikingly decorated. Um, she was one of a group of mummies uh, found by uh, Petrie, and he describes this group in slightly different terms in his, um, his memoirs uh, at the end of his life, uh, 70 years in, in archeology, span based on his excavation reports published around the time he uh, brought the uh, excavated material back and in his letters. Uh, personal letters to sponsors. So three, these are three different uh, contexts which uh, borrow from each other. So to take one example, he describes the mummies as two little girls, quite too splendaciously got up, all head, bust and arms and feet of moulded stucco, gilded all over and inlaid with actual stones. And this really betrays this sense of Victorian propriety, um, because these are uh, the, the mummies of children, um, but children clearly born to wealthy families who can afford to have them uh, treated and decorated and mummified in this way. And it seems too showy, frankly, to Petrie. Too, they are too splendaciously got up uh, for children. And it's a little nod to the fact that although children these uh, mummies are represented in death as adults, just as miniature adults. And so again, it's counterintuitive perhaps to a modern uh, Western thinking that one of the ways that if you were unfortunate and died as a child, uh, you might want to enjoy the afterlife is to be shown as a full sexually mature adult to exist in the afterlife. And so we just have to compare this small mummy um, features in, in the Golden Mummies exhibition with another, also in the exhibition, of uh, an adult lady. So this is the mummy of a lady called Isaias on the left, and the form is pretty much the same. 
uh, the, the mummy on the right uh, is simply rendered on a smaller scale with the aim, as I say, of having the features that would want to be enjoyed in the afterlife. You wouldn't want to remain as a child and perhaps really there wasn't an expectation that children who died in, in, in childhood would exist in the afterlife as children. They would be magically grown up, they would magically mature uh, for a full socialized uh, adult existence in whatever came after. But Petrie <laughs> goes on at some length um, about really being overwhelmed by this material. So these two were, were two well-preserved examples he was able to, to bring away and to give to sponsors, including uh, a major Manchester cotton uh, businessman, uh, Jesse Howarth, uh, who is basically the, the reason Manchester has uh, this particularly rich uh, group, of, group of objects. But Petrie was finding lots and lots and lots of mummies. So these are uh, only a small proportion, of course, of a very big total number. And some of them weren't very well preserved. So here is an example uh, in uh, the World Museum in Liverpool. Actually, I'm in Liverpool at the moment, um, uh, not terribly far away from Manchester, maybe a 40 minute train uh, ride. Um, Liverpool has this very eloquent testimony, testimony to the fact Petrie sometimes was really only bringing away the gold leaf. It hadn't um, uh, survived terribly well. The underlying cartonage, this uh, plaster and papyrus or plaster and linen uh, material um, was very common in the Greco-Roman period. And um, Petrie's characterization of the gilded material was not very positive. He talked about uh, the plague of uh, golden mummies that he had to deal with. And so it all seems to have been rather an encumbrance and he was very disparaging about the style uh, for reasons I suggested at the start of the lecture. Greco-Roman material falls outside that classical Petri pure Egyptian uh, artistic production. And because it wasn't proper, it wasn't fully properly Egyptian, he didn't really like it that much. And so he talks about bringing these dreadful, gaudy mummies back uh, for, for um, the Philistine sponsors uh, he has in England. Uh, he's very dismissive of it. But this attitude, uh, like a lot of things in Egyptology, because Petrie said it, it persists pretty much unchallenged. And so there's always been a bit of a stigma surrounding uh, this material. And it's rather unfortunate because it, it uh, really gets away even more so than usual in Egyptology from the actual intentions of the makers of these objects. By covering mummies of uh, elite people in gold, yes, of course, it's a sign of um, status, it's a sign of wealth, it's a way of showing off, but it is not uh, simply um, a way to make uh, things look shiny. Um, and to look expensive, it is a way of actively promoting the divinity of the deceased. Not simply, uh, although it's in a way it's, it's a kind of semantic question in English, I guess, it's not simply a question of symbolizing divinity, uh, but it's a way of actively promoting and ensuring and um, emphasizing the, the divinity of the deceased by applying uh, gold leaf to them. We know this because there are several sources for the importance of gold in relation to representing and engendering divinity. So this is already known in the New Kingdom in royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Um, for example, on one of the gilded shrines actually that surrounds uh, the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun from his tomb KV62, uh, there is a text uh, known in Egyptology with wonderful title of the myth of the celestial cow. And in this there's a kind of mythic description of the created world in early times uh, when the gods actually lived amongst uh, humanity. So it is said it happened that the sun god, Re, arose, the self-created God, after he had occupied the kingship on earth. 
when humans and gods were still together. Then the people devised a plot against Ray. His majesty was old, his bones were silver, his limbs were gold, his hair was genuine lapis lazuli, this semi-precious blue stone. His majesty perceived the plot people had devised against him. So although this is often understood in Egyptology as a, a, a kind of way of, of describing how you should make cult statues of the gods, this is how gods should, should appear, it also, I guess, represents uh, a god in slightly kind of compromised and uh, subpar condition. Uh, the, the god, in this case, the sun god Ray, is described as being old, and he's kind of a, in a semi-fossilized state. He's not at full power. Uh, so his bones are described as uh, of silver, his flesh is of gold, and his hair is, is, is blue, this uh, lapis lazuli. So here we have a statement that gods uh, can have flesh of gold. So the idea is um, articulated again and again, uh, perhaps more explicitly, that gold will somehow help the deceased join the gods and fundamentally, a point that we're still rather uncomfortable with in the modern West, the deceased really expects not just to join the gods, but to actively become a god. And it's, I guess, the difference between saying, you know, you want to follow Jesus Christ and saying you actually want to become Jesus Christ. So in a modern Judeo-Christian tradition, this is deeply unsettling. And so we kind of dismiss the idea. But it does seem to be what the ancient Egyptian texts uh, say. So the purpose of gold is articulated quite explicitly. Uh, contemporary with the actual production and mummification of these people. Um, so at the same time as uh, the mummies from Hawara, the Tarin, the gold mummies exhibition are being produced, uh, this text, the so-called embalming ritual, is being used, it's being composed um, and uh, used in, in funerary rituals. So it is said that the sun god, sun god Ray, will, so this is an address to the deceased, it is said, he will gild your body for you a beautiful colour, even to the extremities of uh, your limbs. He will make your skin flourish with gold. There's a wonderful set of, of, of puns here, as uh, ancient Egyptians are very fond of punning, not as a kind of a, a flippant, humorous pun, but as a deeply, fundamentally meaningful uh, way of word association. So language is very powerful, and representing things in texts, in ritual texts especially, is a way of making them happen. So again, in this text, it is said, gold will illuminate your face. There's something very important about having your face um, bright in the, uh, in the afterlife, in the underworld, uh, like the gods. You will breathe because of gold. You will come forth because of gold. So coming forth, the idea of coming forth into the world is, is very important. It represents and implies motion and freedom of movement, which you want in the afterlife. And indeed that very ominously titled, in modern times, text called what we call the Book of the Dead, in fact, in ancient times, was called the Book of Coming Forth by Day. So gold will enable this. So gold is not just a pretty decoration, it is really a way of if you can afford it, experiencing and getting yourself into uh, the afterlife, a successful afterlife, an afterlife to be enjoyed. And to anticipate uh, the question I'm often asked, what do we know of, of non-elite people? Well, the answer is not a lot, because there is very, very limited evidence for, for people who are not in this elite circle, the, the, the wealthy that are represented by these gold mummies. And so examining these masks, uh, these mummy decorations, in some way is a great testament to the multiculturalism of Egyptian society, at least as it's represented in this elite material. So here we have the mummy of Isaias. Uh, here she is. Um, from the front, very striking. This really only came out uh, when we were photographing this material for um, 
the exhibition and we were doing conservation on the objects before they, they traveled to the United States. So at the top, this looks like a fashionable Roman lady. She has these corkscrew uh, pearls and jewelry and she appears as a Roman lady. Then beneath on the shroud, there are classical pharaonic uh, representations. So you can see this again, uh, taken from this angle. So you have the mask uh, of the lady, which was quite badly damaged and was subsequently restored uh, when she, she returned to Manchester uh, Museum, when she came to Manchester Museum. There's a lot of restoration work has gone on here. Um, then at the top of the mummy in Greek is her name. So her name is Isaius, daughter of Demetrios. Um, prior to the exhibition, her name was misunderstood uh, and was read as uh, Demetria. Um, in fact, her name does seem to be uh, Isaiah's daughter of Demetrios. And then behind on the mask, you can see again these very pharaonic um, uh, motifs. There is the protective vulture around the head. And at the back, a detail, very exciting detail I had never seen until we introduced a mirror, uh, these jackals on standards with rearing uraei, uh, that's the jackal there, on a, on a standard, and um, these are the classical uh, pharaonic um, motifs, um, wet wa wet, the kind of opener of the ways into the underworld, represented uh, still here in the, the first, maybe early second century, B, uh, sorry, AD, uh, this is into the Roman period. So you have simultaneously both uh, Roman, Greek and Egyptian identity, this very multicultural identity uh, being asserted. And although Petrie said that the hieroglyphs on uh, these mummies was all garbled because people couldn't understand hieroglyphs, that is just demonstrably untrue because we know contemporary temple decorations have lengthy and legible texts on them. So people could understand hieroglyphs in the first, second, uh, even into the uh, third and fourth centuries uh, AD. And here you have an interesting little caption. Um, so the deceased, this is the, the deceased lady here, Isaias, shown as a, a, a woman in the mask, a, a Greco-Roman woman. But on the shroud, on the bandages, she's shown an absolutely classical, albeit rather fleshy uh, Ptolemaic Greek uh, into Roman style uh, as an Egyptian woman obeying all the, the, the standard conventions in front of the sun god, sun god uh, Ray, uh, with his with his uh, bird's head and a sun disc on uh, the top of his head and the hieroglyphs say words spoken by Ray. So there was there was um, an understanding of how to read and how to reproduce meaningful hieroglyphs at Tawara in the first and second centuries AD. And so to get to another of the words of my title, um, uh, not just gold, but sex. This was the image I, I, I chose, uh, beautifully photographed uh, by the exhibition photographer, uh, Julia, uh, Julia Thorne, whose work is, is represented in the exhibition and uh, beautifully reproduced in the book. Um, this is not simply overt sexuality um, for the sake of titillation. Uh, but it is sexuality in the service of rebirth. And this is already something that is known in earlier pharaonic uh, times, but this idea of the heavy wig with the heavy decorated um, uh, floral decoration on the top of the head, the exposed breasts, is something to associate the deceased in particular with the goddess Hathor. Now, we know from, so this piece, uh, which is really a mummy cover, it's not a coffin as such, but it's a cartonage mummy cover um, based on parallels, um, as suggested by my predecessor, Christina Riggs, is likely to come from an outlying place in Egypt, uh, in the Western desert, uh, the Kharga Oasis, um, based on that decoration. But it's not dissimilar to representations of, of women from the very early, um, first century AD, maybe even towards the end of uh, the last century um, BCE. And so these ladies from Achmim, a site in southern Middle Egypt, have the same elaborate headgear with, with, with the, the, the elaborate wigs. 
sometimes interpreted uh, as, as versions of the goddess Isis. Um, to me, looking at one example, so, so that is one in the British Museum. This is one from Manchester that's in the Golden Mummy show. Again, of a child, maybe only four or five years old, but shown again as a miniature adult. So with the full womanly curves of an adult, but appropriate for the, the resurrection of a child. Um, we need only compare this image, again, probably from Achmin, with this. Uh, this is an object, one of a whole series, a vast series of objects in terracotta that was used as part of domestic household religion. They do appear in tombs, they do appear at temple sites, but fundamentally these seem to have been the religion of the home. These are objects to do with um, domestic religion. And so it does seem to be a, a version of the goddess Hathor that is represented here. And why I think there is a there is a, a comparison is not simply because of the form that the forms uh, do do seem to correlate, but already in the Ptolemaic period, uh, and we have an example that, that illustrates this in the exhibition, women are actually referred to an epithet of the deceased, a kind of characterization of the deceased, is not as it had been previously the Osiris. When you talk in the pharaonic period about a dead person, most of the time you talk about an Osiris from the Middle Kingdom onwards. You talk about an Osiris as a deceased person that's kind of coalesced with this god of, god of Reba. Beginning in the Ptolemaic period, women who previously had been referred to as an Osiris begin to be referred to as Hathor, this mistress of the West, this goddess, yes, of drunkenness and of partying, but also uh, the goddess who welcomes you into, into the West. A goddess of overt sexuality, yes, but a goddess appropriate uh, for uh, an appropriate ambition uh, for the deceased uh, to coalesce with in the afterlife. And there are other details that assert kind of divine royal uh, protection. Um, on the decoration of an elite person who wasn't royal, and I always emphasize this, none of the mummies in the exhibition belong to, to princesses, although it's often assumed a mummy covered in gold must be uh, a member of the royal family. To the best of our knowledge, they're not. So here looking at the details, just to take one detail without um, kind of anatomizing the whole, the whole, the whole uh, decorative scheme, Something you wouldn't commonly get in pharaonic times, but which you do uh, certainly here in the Roman period, is the use of this coiled snake. Now, traditionally, of course, the, the rearing cobra is a, a, a sign of um, divine royal protection. The king wears it on his brow. Um, but in the Roman period, late Ptolemaic period, that, that coiled snake becomes co-opted um, as a, as a way of, of defending the deceased in the passage into the afterlife, an extremely dangerous transition where you needed all the help and protection uh, you could get. And so I like this example because it's absolutely resonant of this idea. And we have an example actually in the exhibition of oriental decadence and excess. This is something that oriental ladies would wear, This this kind of, coiled uh, cobra and one need look no further than the Hollywood 1960s characterization of Elizabeth Taylor as uh, Cleopatra. A complete fantasy of course uh, but one we find seductive so when we look at these mummies we are using modern culture references as a way to mediate and interpret ancient funerary art and this is a problem because there are lots of false friends along the way. There are lots of misrepresentations of what these things might mean. It's not simply oriental excess, it is a deeply serious uh, religious motif, a way of um, protecting and preserving the deceased as a person for uh, eternity. So I couldn't talk about this material without talking about the most famous of Greco-Roman features of great Greco-Roman funerary art and one again we find deeply seductive and these are the so-called Fion portraits. Called the Fion portraits because they they come or are known mainly through Petrie's excavations and the excavations of others at Hawara and other Fion sites but I should say these painted portraits are known 
from all over the country, from as far north as Alexandria and all the way down south into Aswan. So it's really the material that uh, from Hawara, as you see here. So the, the two on the left are uh, Manchester Museum pieces and the exhibition, the piece on the right is in the British Museum, but also from Hawara. Now, I've been in galleries with uh, fine portraits on display and you cannot help but overhear people's reactions to them. You look at them from a modern Western representationalist point of view and you cannot help seeing a living, breathing person. Maybe someone, they remind you of someone you know or, or uh, someone you've, you've seen a picture of. They, they spark these, these visual cues of recognition but it's a leap to say that these represent people as they actually appeared. And lots of work, including work at Manchester Museum, has tried to show that the Fayoum portraits represent people as they actually were. Uh, to me, that seems like a fantasy. The Fayoum portraits are part of a wider representational strategy for memorialising the deceased. Here um, from Palmyra in Syria, these two pieces in the Manchester Museum archaeology collection that uh, are also traveling as part of the golden mummies uh, show, although they're not Egyptian, they're probably very familiar to you, sadly, for, for unfortunate reasons, um, that these were the kind of things targeted by so-called Islamic State um, at Palmyra in, in Syria. And they've, they've recently made the news over the last uh, few years. But these are maybe more easily characterized as memorials but they're, they're made of local limestone, they're in three dimensions, um, but they are the equivalent and they are contemporary with uh, the Roman representations from Egypt, these uh, fine portraits. And as I've said, um, one cannot look at a mummy, uh, a human mummy or an animal mummy for that matter, in a modern uh, museum exhibition without wanting to see inside. Uh, it has become an absolute expectation that there will be CT scans or at the very least radiographs uh, to, to, to reveal some hidden truths. Um, and so we have had to be careful about how we uh, represent um, this kind of information in the exhibition. Just to get back to my uh, point before, one has to emphasize that although these appear very lifelike, they are also idealizing. They are the ancient Egyptian, uh, Greco-Roman Egyptian equivalent of the of the Instagram filter of at very least a little bit of a Photoshop touch up on your family photographs uh, to make the people look a bit better. And because they have the the flash of light in the eyes, this is something, you know, really you, you, you think you're looking at a real person. There's, there's light in those eyes, there's life in that face. It's worth saying, you know, there are little allusions to divinity and the hyper real here. So the, this young man and the mummy is, is of a young man, maybe only 17 or 18 years old, based on his dentition. Um, he, he's shown as young and handsome and lithe and athletic and all these uh, different things that was the Greco-Roman ideal in Egypt. But he has gilded uh, leaves in his hair, these laurels. Uh, uh, an implication in the classical world of, of divinity. And if you look very closely, this is clearer when you're actually looking at the object, um, between his lips, there's a little line of gold, gold leaf has been painted. Now, some mummies have little uh, gold, gold leaf uh, tongue amulets applied to the tongue. And this is again a, a way of associating the deceased with gold in a subtle way. Uh, there are gold studs on the, the bandages here. There's little details of gold. So this is more than a human being. This is not simply a snapshot of this man as he actually appeared. And it's interesting working with um, colleagues who deal with biomedical material uh, from Egypt, looking at the scan, recent re-evaluation of the CT scans of this man um, show, according to my colleagues, um, signs of, of significant obesity in this man. Yet the portrait doesn't seem to imply that. So he has a very svelte uh, face, um, but maybe this is improving on reality. Or maybe, you know, the portraits, although we're seduced by them, don't or haven't been meant to represent people really as they actually were. 
ถูกไหมใช่มั้ยไหมอ่อน um yes I'm 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 okay um I want to look a little at the representation and the reception of these images because what you see even in a museum the supposed seat of authority and transmitter of truth is not what you get museums don't simply transmit true facts they construct facts they 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 create information. They they create facts uh, for audiences, and that is definitely true of ancient Egypt. This construction of ancient Egypt is going on uh, all the time in uh, museums. So here, just to get back to the mummy of i s a i u s here on the right, uh, we have uh, I discovered an archival photograph of. I suspect it's in the 1930s or 40s. Uh, the curator. Uh, Mary uh, Shaw. Um, up until I took uh, the post at Manchester Museum, the, the Egyptology curator had always been a woman. Um, uh, so, so a lot of pressure to to fill those those shoes. Um, and the, this is the senior technician Harry Spencer reconstructing the face of Isaias. So her her face was very badly damaged, and it was simply created, perhaps with reference to other mummies from Bawara, but. Essentially, as what Mary Shaw and Harry Spencer thought the face should look like, so it's not simply a representation of the face as found. When Petrie um, excavated this material, he was very aware of, of of needing to continue his excavations and of the uh, viability of those excavations as attracting attention. So he would have annual summer exhibitions. Uh, in which he would show off his finds, and so the finds from Hawara uh, were shown off uh, at least once in an 1888 exhibition, uh, including these so-called Fayum portraits from Hawara at the Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly in London. Incredible place, a kind of sideshow, kind of vaudeville uh, location. It's where Belzoni had 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 his great show in the 1820s, um, where mummy unwrappings took place. A bit titillating, so it's interesting that um, Petrie chose this. And it was here that some very famous people saw those 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 objects from Hawara, including the fine portraits. So um, the the um, orientalizing romantic artist uh, Lawrence Alma Tadema, well known for his, his scenes of the ancient world. These scenes, incidentally, inspired uh, the visuals for for Ridley Scott's uh, film Gladiator. So those kind of light, bright uh, images are, are, in large part, due to Alma Tadema paintings. Here is is one of my favourites. Loves jeweled feta, where you see um, what I think is is really um, a direct direct influence of Flinders Petrie and Flinders Petrie's ideas, because. At Tawara, he found what he described as an Oxford frame, which he speculated could have been used uh, to frame and hang one of these uh, Fayum portraits in the home. And here, this domesticated context of this 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 portrait is is visualised by Alma Tadema uh, in this 1895 uh, painting. Remember, he went to see. We know for sure Alma Tadema is in the visitor book of that 1888 show. So, so one can really um, Plausibly suggest a, a connection between the, the the two. Here, it's assumed that the portraits have been hang, hung on the wall. I don't personally suspect they were. They could have had another ritual function, uh, but fundamentally, I suspect they were they were posthumous portraits. Um, but perhaps the most striking uh, modern um, influence of the fine portraits is in the work of Oscar Wilde, because a portrait of Dorian Gray, picture of Dorian Gray. Um, although Wilde himself, his father was was an Egyptophile, he travelled to Egypt. Oscar Wilde is very likely to have at least known about, if not actually visited, uh, the uh, the show at the Egyptian Hall in 1888. Um, Petrie says, you know, he's he's very careful about who he allows in uh, to to the show. Um, you know, proper upstanding members of society. Whether in 1888 Petrie would have felt Oscar Wilde was a, a proper upstanding member of society or just a dandy, 
or something else uh, is, is, is of course, unrecorded. But um, it's very striking, I think, that Oscar Wilde's homoerotic tale um, about this beautiful young man with his, uh, you know, preternatural, supernatural relationship to this portrait in the attic surely um, was was influenced by uh, Oscar Wilde's knowing of or actually seeing these portraits of very handsome young men on top of the bodies of these wizened, mummified uh, corpses. So the picture of Dorian Gray, I think, is a really eloquent testament to the influence of this material, Greco-Roman funerary material, that sexiness that I spoke about at the start, really being picked up and used by Wilde in the same way as back in the first and second centuries AD, ancient Egyptian culture itself uh, had appealed uh, to people, Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, mixtures of the three who lived in Hawara and uh, other sites in Egypt, but which um, that, that, that incredible artistic heritage, that um, very attractive idea of the afterlife, which remember Greeks and Romans didn't, as far as they conceptualized the afterlife, didn't have much to look forward to, whereas the Egyptian afterlife offered something much, much, much more attractive. So there are these these echoes of the past right the way um, down through through time, and this is, I think, um, the reason that Greco-Roman funerary material has that particular attractiveness for a modern, certainly a modern museum-going audience that maybe it hasn't had in scholarship. It hasn't maybe been so appealing to scholars until fairly recently, where it, whereas I think it has always been popular with the public in a way that maybe in some fashion pharaonic material hasn't. So with that, I will say thank you very much for listening. If you want to know more about the exhibition, especially if you can visit it immediately, as Caroline said, I'm delighted to say, although Manchester Museum's uh, shop is soon to be online, um, listeners, viewers uh, in the UK and in Europe, um, I'm hopeful of making an announcement very soon about the, the, the book being available from Manchester Museum itself. So uh, look out uh, for that on, on social media. I'll give you details at the end. Um, for those lucky enough to be in North Carolina itself, you can maybe physically pick up a copy uh, from the museum or um, the NCMA uh, website is, is offering uh, copies. Uh, I know there are people in the audience who actually have a copy, uh, lucky you. Um, if you're interested uh, in the subject uh, that I've, I've uh, covered or attempted to cover, briefly tonight, and you're not absolutely sick of the sound of my voice, uh, my dulcet uh, Glaswegian brogue, um, then I'm running a whole week course uh, as part of the wonderful Bloomsbury Summer School on Zoom, so you don't have to physically be in Bloomsbury in London between the 12th and 16th of uh, April, so do uh, check that out on the Bloomsbury Summer School uh, website, give it a Google, and if you want uh, and are inspired by hearing about Egyptology and uh, you enjoy the exhibition and you want to support uh, work of conservation and promotion of Egyptian cultural heritage, please do join us uh, at the Egypt Exploration Society. Membership uh, from as little as uh, 20 something pounds uh, does help uh, material and colleagues, most importantly, in Egypt. Uh, I'm very proud to be the vice chair of the board of trustees of the Egypt Exploration Society. So check out the EES uh, at eesac.uk. And if you have any questions, I would be delighted to take them. If I can't get round to them, or if you want to contact me, uh, I regularly blog uh, on WordPress for the museum, and my social media handle, if you like, is at Egypt MCR. And so with that, I will say thank you very much, and I welcome any questions. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Campbell, for a wonderful lecture, as always. Um, Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> can, I, can I quickly go and get a refresher while people ask the questions and you gather yes, them? Yes, while we gather the questions, please do. Uh, if you do have questions, um, include them in the Q&A or in the chat. And um, Maria is feeding those questions to me, and I will feed them to Campbell as soon as he's um, gotten something to drink.
I see we have a lot of questions coming up. And for those who wanted to uh, get a copy of the catalog, it is available um, at the museum store, but it can also be purchased um, online as well. Um, and that goes for, um, for the US. Uh, I'm not sure if we're um, shipping to Europe at this point, typically we are not. Um, so do be sure to look it up on the museum uh, website. I think the link was placed in the chat for those of you who are not in the triangle. And also just to answer a more general question, some people have had to leave a little bit early or could not make it. Um, the lecture has been recorded and we will be sharing this link with you. I think Maria mentioned that earlier um, as well. So if you um, want to watch it again, um, especially docents, for example, I see a lot of them um, have signed into this lecture, um, but others haven't. Um, this is a very good lecture to share with others. Diane, do you, uh, I saw you on there, so please share. And Campbell is back. All right, get ready. We have a bunch of um, questions. <laughs> as you know, Caroline, and as regular viewers will know, here in the UK it's 6 p.m. and I enjoy a, a little cocktail. So cheers. Thank you for the invitation to give the lecture. Absolutely. Uh, maybe too early for a cocktail in, uh, in Raleigh. <clears throat> well, your Saturday brunch, perhaps. <laughs> oh, Saturday brunch, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, let's see. We have some questions related to uh, gold. Oh, um, yeah. Is gold truly meant to represent the material product of gold as such, or is it a relation, let me just make this, relationship of this material to light, the sun, reflectivity, shining, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Excellent uh, question and, and point. Um, and a, a subject I, I delve into in, in that particular chapter of the book. So uh, definitely get, get a hold of the copy of the book. I think there is definitely something about, uh, as the questioner suggests, reflectivity of the sunlight. And I know other scholars have worked on earlier material, so um, third intermediate period material, where you have, for example, a yellow coffin. So if you're maybe not going for gold, you can have yellow, uh, which implies this reflection of the sun's light. And we know from that, um, from the text, the embalming ritual and, and others, that it's a hope uh, of the deceased to be in the sunlight in the afterlife. So you want to be having this sunny glow and maybe the gold uh, represents that in some way. Although I should say, the actual material, I think the, the, the material, the, un, the untarnishable nature of gold is very attractive on its own terms, uh, on its own basis. Thank you for the question. So that was uh, Katie's question. We have a question from Carol. Why are the feet of the mummies exposed and gilded and not the whole body? So we have the head, sometimes yeah. the hands and the feet. Why not the rest? That's an interesting question. It was one that I was asked. Um, I was asked about uh, by the docents at um, at Buffalo. Actually, uh, several visitors had asked, "Why are the feet exposed?" And you know, I have a little theory about that. Um, as you you'll know, Caroline, in the show there are a couple of mummies that have the enemies of the deceased shown, and I think there's something about to have the power over the enemies, you have to represent the feet. There's something, it kind of implies, I guess, there's a whole body molded there that's been wrapped in, in, in bandages. In fact, we know, and CT scans confirm, for example, in the, the mummy of Isaias, yes, her feet pop out, but there's just a foot case, it's just a plaster foot case, and the mask only goes down to the chest. There is no other covering for the rest of the, the body. And I think the importance really is to imply feet 
uh, to, to show the feet in connection with something I mentioned in the lecture to imply freedom of movement and having the ability to move in the afterlife, but also having power over your enemies because they're underfoot. Excellent. Um, we hear we have a question, an anonymous question. If children were depicted as adults, do you think elders would have been depicted in their prime? Ah, good, good point. Yes. Although there are uh, exceptions to this rule, um, we do have one or two examples. There's one, for example, in the collection of, of uh, Sigmund Freud in the Freud Museum in London, which shows an elderly man. And there are elderly women shown as well. But for the most part, I think as, as to the extent that it can be believed, where CT data shows evidence of an older person, often the portrait shows a younger person. So you're shown in your prime. Yes. And that goes to a bigger question about are the portraits, you know, are they painted from life? I don't think they are. Um, I would rather suggest that they're all posthumous because you know especially for younger people uh, petrie's theory about having a, a portrait painted in your prime and then it hanging around on the wall in your home doesn't work for for kids because why would you have a portrait painted when you were a kid and i think the same is true of older people they die when they're older the portrait is painted showing them in a younger state thank you for that answer um, we've had a couple questions that I've um, re dealt with. Um, the actual mummies, are the mm. people um, who have been mummified, are they Greek, Roman, or Egyptian? Um, that's, that's a tricky question. And there was another yeah. one related to this was, was it ever any DNA done to you know if they're Greek, Roman, and Egyptian? The excellent question, and there would be no way, even if we could get access to the DNA, to tell if they were Egyptian or Roman or Greek, because I think this and it is a really important point, and I, I suggested it earlier, use of portraits and masks doesn't fall along these kind of ethnic national lines. You could have a Greek person living in Hawara who wanted to appear as an Egyptian, uh, an ethnically Egyptian person who wanted to appear kind of a la mode perhaps with with a with a portrait and it, it always reminds me of i don't know if someone at pompeii it's a bad example if someone was at pompeii was wearing levi jeans would you say that's an american no it's it's simply an affectation so i would even go as far as to say we cannot even discuss it's impossible to discuss ethnic identity because it's so mixed. It was such a multicultural uh, society. Thank you for the answer. And, and yes, when you are living in a multicultural society, um, you can still, like I am a Canadian in the yeah. US, you're a Scot in the, you know, England. Yeah. Um, we maintain some of our uh, cultural identity. We live elsewhere. We speak different languages, that sort of thing. So. Uh, you become almost a hybrid, if you will. Exactly, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, now I have a question about flowers. Um, flowers? Mm -hmm. I notice flowers in the hands of some of the mummy casings, but they don't mm -hmm. look like lotus flowers or papyrus uh, umbels, yeah. which the person is more familiar with. Uh, yeah. What types of flowers are these and what are their significance? And good, good. Good, good question. Um, and my colleague, uh, our botany curator, is going to be upset that I don't remember the um, the botanical term. But what I will say is Petrie found large amounts of floral material at Hawara. Uh, we have some in, in Manchester. There's, I know there's lots in the British Museum. I forget what the term is for them. Um, uh, but they are a flower which was associated, I think, in more classical contexts with permanence and endurance and other things. But you're right, they're not, they don't seem to be using mm -hmm. lotus flowers or lilies in the same way that you might ex expect, you know, as a reference to pharaonic times. So they have a significance, yes, definitely, because they appear a lot 
in the hands of the deceased, both men and women. It's not gendered, um, but I forget, sorry, what the, the genus or the botanical name is. There's a question here that makes me laugh and I can answer that question is, what is okay. Dr. Price preferred tipple? And that would be gin. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline knows, she's been in some bars with me. Gin, thanks for the question. This, this, is, this is Edinburgh gin I'm drinking. Let's see, um, maybe a couple more questions. Sure. Like, well, we, we know quite a bit about ancient, the ancient Egyptians' philosophy about their afterlife. What was their philosophy while living? Gosh, uh, now you're asking. Um, I, I mean, I guess, like I say to students in Manchester, ultimately, much as we would love to, we, we don't have a time machine and we, we can't go back and really, really ask people questions. And there's something about... <laughs> We should probably be more honest, and we're, I know we're trying to be in museums, about how much we know and how much we're kind of inferring. What we're looking at in Golden Mummies is the material evidence that could indicate um, ideas about the afterlife, expectations about the afterlife. What people actually believed about the afterlife, we can't say for sure, because there could be a, a kind of just a convention or there's social religious reasons for doing things, but it's, it's not clear. What their philosophies were during life is even more obscure. Uh, they don't really write about it at length, um, unless you infer, I guess, from poetry or, or laundry lists or letters or stuff. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I can't answer Caroline, if you've got an answer, <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Like you're saying, we are interpreting the material. Um, yeah. So there's, even though we try not to be biased, we weren't there 3,000 yeah. years ago. Exactly. So we're, we'd love to be. we're interpreting what we see, which is already an interpretation um, of reality. Yes, yes, um, exactly. So we're several levels layers removed. Um, so we're, it, it's our best guess. What we're offering is based on material culture and, and writing, but none of us were there. And I'm pretty sure that a bunch of Egyptologists, if not all of us, would love to go back and see yeah. how right or how wrong we actually <laughs> yeah. are. Exactly. Um, and perhaps one last question uh, sure. here. Ahmim seems to have a distinct funerary culture yeah. Um, do you agree? Any thoughts on this? I, I would agree based on the stuff that's in our show, uh, the Golden Mummy show. Yes, there is. Um, so in the Ptolemaic period, so we have the mummy of uh, a lady called Ta Sheri Ankh um, in the exhibition uh, with really stunning new photos. This was an unpublished piece uh, in the Manchester collection that's really well represented in the book. Um, that's a detail in the Ptolemaic period that, that is a kind of giveaway for one of these um, Anachmim mummy is these really large eyes, really preternaturally large eyes. Um, in the Roman period, into the Roman period, I showed a couple of slides, one piece from the exhibition, one piece from the British Museum, where there's quite an elaborate garment worn by uh, females. Uh, which I don't think occurs at other sites. Um, so I would agree with the statement there is a distinctive funerary tradition there. And it's interesting to compare what happens at Hawara with what happens at Ahmim. And it will be different again in Abydos and Aswan and Alexandria. And people tend to forget there's not one homogenous ancient Egyptian style, especially not in the Greco-Roman period, and it's very regional. So hopefully that gets suggested in the, the exhibition in the book. And, and we, we see this also in pharaonic Egypt, just to yeah. expand on um, your points, um, that you can distinguish a coffin from Thebes mm. from a coffin from further north. Um, and that's usually like these stylistic features are what we use in museums um, to um, try to find where an object might have come from if it doesn't have a provenance. So we're doing stylistic studies. So there are um, distinctions between um, areas. 
um, even in Farion. Yes, agreed. Egypt. Okay, agreed. last question. I think that yeah. seems like a good one. Did Coptic Christians adopt some of the burial rituals and symbols from Greco-Roman Egypt? Um, as in the, as in the, did they mummify their deceased? Excellent question to end on because it, it really is the question of the end of mummification. And as been asked before, I'm sure we both have been asked, when does mummification stop? So the coming of Christianity obviously puts an end to pagan polytheistic religion in Egypt. And I would say we actually have in, in Manchester a lot of material evidence for Christian burials. And it seems that there is not an attempt to mummify the body. And this is a bigger issue of what is mummification all about? Is it preserving the body, which I'm becoming increasingly skeptical of, or is it simply a ritual treatment, which may have the effect of preserving flesh, but which is basically meant to transform you into a god. Um, and I think that practice stops with, with, the, with, with the coming of, of Christianity. And as far as I'm aware, uh, there, is, there is simply the burial of the body with very simple treatment of the actual flesh and the dressing uh, in, in clothing. So there's not an attempt to dehydrate or to treat with significant amounts of resin and there's not an attempt to actually wrap the body. That ends, it seems, with the, the widespread adoption of a Christian belief. Well, thank you again for your answers, for your wonderful... Um, pleasure, lecture. absolute pleasure. Pleasure. And, and I, I, I look forward to the lecture in the... What, what date is it, Maria? The, the 17th. So I 17th. will be sending an email to everybody who registered for this lecture uh, with details. It's already up on our website. You can uh, register for it. Um, so I'll be sending that along with the link to the YouTube uh, recording of it. Um, but thank you Great. all, everybody, and we hope you enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Campbell, thank you, for everyone. the fascinating lecture. Caroline, Pleasure. Uh, you did a fantastic job moderating. <laughs> Uh, thank, Thanks, you, Caroline. thank you both and thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Stay safe.